Your small intestine is about 10 feet long. Yes, it is long enough to play jump rope with. No, I don't recommend it. It starts out at your stomach at about an inch and a half, and by the time it ends, it's about an inch wide. So not much variation between start and finish, but it does taper as it goes. 80% of your body's absorption of nutrients occurs here. This is the place. It has three separate regions to help break down different things and to have different functions. The duodenum is the first stop straight off the stomach. This is where we said the pH is about 10 to neutralize the stomach acid. So this is the one closest to the stomach. And it's going to connect through that pyloric sphincter that we saw. And it will also receive excretions or secretions from the pancreas and liver. So these are going to help do digestion as well. The jejunum is about three feet long, and most of our chemical absorption um, and digestion of nutrients in water is going to occur here. So after we absorb what we can in the duodenum, most of it is actually going to occur here. So this center section is where we get most of our digestion and absorption of the sections of the small intestine. The ileum is the last part. It's about six feet long and connects with, with our large intestine through yet another sphincter muscle. Some of our accessories that we're interested in are the bile that are produced by the liver and stored in your gallbladder. You may know someone who has gallbladder issues, or you may. This is critical. Bile is critical for the breakdown of fats. Pancreatic juices. The pancreas, we know, produces insulin, but that is not a digestive function. It also produces digestive enzymes, and that's what we're interested in now. It's going to dump that at the beginning of the small intestine and help to break down things in the small intestine. If we look at a cross section of the digestive tract, it has a ton of layers. The one I'm interested in you knowing about, though, is this muscularis external layer. These are two layers of muscle, actually, um, that are going to contract in two different ways and do peristalsis. So just like we saw peristalsis in your esophagus, we'll see it again here. And its job is the same here. It's to help push things through your digestive tract. The mucosa layer is going to be our internal lining. This is critical. So this lining is going to be full of folds to increase our surface area and also be full of villi. So this is going to help us increase absorption. So if we look at a cross section to make it easier for you, you see that these are columnar epithelials. Columnar epithelial cells. And their job, as you see, they're very, very tall. These are each individual cells, each one of these are going to be absorption. They have huge surface area, that's important. And we have to look on some of them as having these microvilli, and they're going to be important for helping to move things along and absorb things and be receptors for things and so on. Those muscle layers that I was mentioning to you are over here on the left. You notice the lines on this muscle go this way and the lines on this muscle go this way. The job here of this muscle the two layers is to move food along. But why go in two directions? Well, we have one that goes around. So when this muscle contracts and shortens, it's actually going to pinch your small intestine shut. That doesn't seem good, but we saw this in your esophagus. It pinches and pushes and pinches and pushes and pinch and open, pinch and open. And then we get these muscle layers going in the other direction. If they shorten, what's going to happen to your small intestine? It gets shorter. If they contract, 
those muscles will get shorter. So you're shortening and squeezing. So this helps move food along easier, keeps things moving through your digestive system. Most of what you are taking up from your small intestine is because of diffusion. Now, occasionally we do have to go against the concentration gradients with active transport, but much of what we get, fortunately, is by diffusion. If we're absorbing fats and amino acids and sugars, we've got to get it into the cells of our small intestine, but then we also need to get it into our bloodstream because it does us no good if it's just going to sit around in the cells. So this layer of cells is going to be absorbing things as it passes through your small intestine. So if this is the inside of your small intestine, right? The lining. So if this is the lining inside your small intestine, these are all cells around here. And when we look at these villi, these huge gatherings of cells, what we're looking for is moving nutrients from each individual cell into your bloodstream. So we're trying to get your bloodstream to pick up, we have over here, trying to pick up what's going on from these cells or what's being absorbed by these cells so that you can move it into areas of your body that you need. The pancreas is an accessory organ for your digestive system. It has an exocrine function. So exo means out. So this means that we're actually going to transfer things through something known as a duct. D-U-C-T, not quack quack, but the D-U-C-T is like a tube, okay? This is important because the pancreas also has an endocrine function. Endo is in, right? But this is a very small part of its function. You see the endocrine function is only about 1% of that pancreas, and that's what makes your insulin and your glucagon. Glucagon is going to help us break down glycogen. Insulin helps us transfer sugars. So this endocrine function is really what we usually know the, the pancreas for, but the exocrine function is what I'm interested in today. It works with the liver to supply enzymes and to regulate metabolism. So in this case, we're looking to adjust nutrient levels in the bloodstream simply by regulating what the body is going to absorb from the next meal you eat. The liver also does a lot to break down toxins for us. It's going to help us deal with damaged blood cells, deal with phagocytes, deal with the production of bile. And as we said, that's the digestion of fats. So all of these are connecting together to really help everything work properly. And everything in your digestive system as far as taking up nutrients is still dependent on the heart. Don't forget that. We've got to pump this stuff around your body. And when we start moving things around our body, we're going to have to keep track of nutrients versus waste. The gallbladder on your liver actually stores the bile that is produced by the liver. And what we're looking for is that gallbladder to release the bile into what we call the common hepatic duct that goes into the small intestine. If there is a blockage, if we get a blockage in that gallbladder, it can't release. And for those of you who know someone or might have gallbladder issues, if you eat fatty foods, you actually have a gallbladder attack because you've tried to release bile into the 
small intestine and it gets all backed up and blocked and actually gets pushed back into your liver. So you can live without your gallbladder. We'll give you enzymes to help you break down fats, but you can't eat much of them. It's a very limited um, intake of fats. Otherwise, you have all kinds of complications associated with it. Your large intestine's primary job is to absorb water and vitamins. That's really the big thing. It has two parts. We saw the cecum and how it's going to help us regulate metabolism. We saw the large cecum in our herbivores, right? And we look at getting as much nutrient out as possible. So if there are vitamins left, we're going to start looking at some absorption here. The colon's primary purpose is to absorb water and to store waste until we can move it out of our system. The rectum is the end of the large intestine, so this is the, the essentially the bottom part of your large intestine, and usually this is empty, and it should be empty, except when you have the urge to have a bowel movement, and at that point, you get this peristaltic contraction that tells you you need to go, and that actually is going to tr trigger that reflex, and if you allow it, you have a sphincter that is no, also better known as your anus, and that sphincter is going to control whether or not you actually defecate at that moment. Now, of course, you can have less control of that sphincter under particular conditions. If your bowel is very full, you would have less control over that sphincter. Your body is on, in kind of an urgent state trying to get rid of things. And when we look at sometimes when you're sick, right, you lose control of, of those kind of functions because your body is trying so hard to get things to move, move out. actually taking up water, you ingest about two to two and a half liters of water per day, some much more, of course. Your secretions in your digestive tract produce about seven liters of water per day. We suddenly have a lot of water we have to deal with. Most of it is reabsorbed. most of it. You are actually losing only about 150 milliliters in fecal waste. Now, yes, you will move water out in urine as well, but the idea here is under normal conditions, so this is normal bowel movements, not diarrhea, anything like that, you're losing only about 150 mils of water. We don't want to lose water, right? We're trying to maintain our watery environment. Our vitamins, we have to deal with fat-soluble versus water-soluble vitamins. So fat-soluble vitamins, things like A, D, K, these are actually stored in the body. And if we actually build up too many of these, these can be dangerous. So increased levels of these are actually toxic and can impact your liver. Water-soluble, things like C and B, it would be very hard to overdose on water-soluble vitamins because if you have increased levels of C and B, it simply moves out with the water, so it's attracted to the water, and you just you excrete it, either through urine or through your feces.